Well, Miss Yvonne, or Evan, as they like to call you at Starbucks, welcome oh God, to the yeah. show. <laughs> oh, I got this. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. <laughs> Ordering Starbucks can be a challenge. I know. I bet. Well, I'm so excited that you're here and I get Thanks to so see you on Zoom. Me. I get to hang yeah. out with you. Yeah. Okay. Tell our audience a little bit of who you are, what you do. Give us like the one-two punch backstory of, of Evie. The one two punch back story of Evie is I am a business efficiency consultant. So I love aligning people with their business, the mindset, the systems behind it, all the stuff to just finally build a business that aligns with your life. And that passion came from being an immigrant to the States. So I moved to the States in 2007, went through quite some roller coaster on the personal life. Yeah. Um, which came to the height or low, however you want to see that, in 2014, losing my husband to cancer. And that was that was the big wake up call where I'm like, okay, this this having spent two years full time taking care of him and completely having to rebuild my whole business because I couldn't take care of my clients at that time. There was yeah. I was in it. I was the business. What were you doing at that time? What was the business then? At that time, it was web design and social media, mostly okay. web design, WordPress web design. So I done had, for you services. Exactly. Full on okay. done for you services. I'm like, there were a couple of, quote, passive income streams from hosting my client site and those kind of things. But I wasn't able to tell my schedule between doctor's appointments and him potentially having a bad day. I, I wasn't of service to my clients, so I handed them off to associates of mine, which meant, thankfully, we had a lot of angels in our life that allowed me to do that and pretty much yeah, put everything on ice for two years. Yeah. But yeah, that was, that was the wake-up call where it's like, I cannot be the one in my business. This, yeah. this is not possible. And that's also where the the passion came from of wanting to help women build their freedom of choice. And freedom of choice means having money in the account that you don't have to work for 24-7. Yeah. Well, I would imagine you weren't prepared. And I say that in quotes. I say that lightly. I imagine you weren't prepared to sort of take a step back from the from the work, from the income, from your clients, you know, when you were hit with this awful news. And then I'm sure you weren't prepared for it to be sort of a two year long journey ending the way that it ended, where it kind of leaves you, I would assume upside down, you know, questioning everything and, and really checking in with even what do you want to do and where do you want to go from here? And um, yeah, I would imagine that's a, a wake up call moment for sure. Or wake up call two years for sure. At what point in that process did you start to realize like, okay, systems, because I know this is one of the things that we both like mm -hmm. really agree on. Systems are actually going to create that freedom structure is going to give me that freedom. Where did that come into play? Interestingly enough, there, that was a lot of lesson for me with those repeatable systems, because I had already planned on building a repeatable income system that was on the plan now life initially had other plans because as you said it's like we didn't see that coming and even throughout the first round of cancer was like oh yeah he's going to pull through at 75 percent chance of of full-time recovery right and it actually took a couple of years even after he passed to realize people don't think like i'm thinking where my brain went straight back to, okay, repeatable systems. How can I, for lack of better explanation, put it in a box? How can, how can I find the boundaries of what I'm doing? Because when I can set boundaries to it, I can repeat it. Mm -hmm. If I've done it twice, it needs to be repeatable. It needs to be a template. It needs to be an automation, whatever it is. My brain always worked like that. And after Pete passed away, I did exactly what you what you said. I probably would be doing that was completely evaluating everything I had, everything I was doing. And that's when I'm like, people came to me for social media and web design and they're left with full on business coaching. <laughs> and I'm like, what am I doing here? So that's when the first initial pivot happened to 
okay, I actually know what I'm talking about. I actually know what I'm doing because I see the results on my clients and they just came for web design. Right. And then it took a couple more years to realize that people don't see the world like I do. It's like, I literally do my morning work and I look at the management company and I'm like, why are you doing this? Why are you <laughs> wasting money there? Why are you wasting time there? And it can be tiresome to see systems everywhere. Mm -hmm. But it was also really interesting to to talk with a lot of my my community and a lot of my friends, and they're like, "You you you do what? You 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 see the world how?" And that's when I started realizing that people don't see those repeatable systems, well, and that's when it really became the thing in my business. Right. You had like over 15 years experience though, running different multiple, like different businesses, mm -hmm. helping clients, you know, whether it was organize mm -hmm. and strengthen or streamline businesses, take them to profitability. Is that what you were doing in Germany? What brought you here? <laughs> I'm actually an electrician by trade. I started no, out sir, as an electrician. I, mm -hmm. I was daddy's girl and daddy was an electrician. So I went to school for electrician. I did not know that. That is so cool. And I've done, I've done a lot in hospitality. If that is front of the house, if that is back of the house. And it's like this, this whole idea of systems was always in, yeah. in my core, in my DNA. It's what I've done with clients on web design, on social media. So it's always been there. Interestingly enough, I just, I don't know if I just didn't have the word to it or just not the clarification of what I actually was doing, mm -hmm. or if it was really just the piece of, wait, you don't even realize that we are implementing repeatable processes. Oh, hold on a second. Yeah. So it's like looking back, I'm like, even back to a childhood, like, mom, why am, why are we doing this manually again? So it's always <laughs> been there. I just never really saw it as that's the thing it's like it comes so easy to me and I think yeah a lot of us stumble into this where it's like this is so easy this is really this okay okay <laughs> well, I think that's the gift right there when we can find the thing that is within us that we feel is easy or second nature it's like our default and we could extract the lessons package it up and then serve and sell it's like that right there is the golden ticket, right? Because to you, it's just this thing that is so easy. And I see you even in our mastermind talking to the other girls about your systems and how excited you get about it. And a lot of them glaze over and you're like, no, it's not that complicated. It's not that complicated. So mm -hmm. what I love about you is your way to your ability to take what could feel really overwhelming and confusing and streamline it down and make it really easy to, to see, to approach. And I know for you, you currently are a huge ClickUp lover mm -hmm. and you use ClickUp and you teach ClickUp. Was it always ClickUp or have you been on other platforms too? I even wrote the book on ClickUp. Um, my switch to ClickUp happened, oh my God, 2018, 2018. I was in Asana. I had used Trello in the past. Um, I still believe to this day, Trello just isn't scalable. You're going to hit a ceiling at some point. Sure. Um, I was using Asana specifically, and then I needed I, I needed one of the paid features, not the whole suite, just one feature, and had a not so good customer support experience where I get it, you are going for corporate, I completely get the target market, what they're doing, where they're going for. But just that experience of being brushed off on top of me uh, needing to buy five seats for a solopreneur just left me with a really bad taste. Yeah. And I pride myself to work with companies and use tools that do have the conversation. Even to this day, ClickUp doesn't always make the choices and development that I agree with. But they're always open. They always listen. So in 2018, when all of that happened, I, I went on the hunt and I'm like, OK, what what else is out there? And discovered ClickUp in the early stages. Oh, God, I still remember emailing both co-founders. It's like when you still had like full on access to everybody, right? You knew <laughs> the 10 people on the team. And since then, I just I love it because it has the versatility of for creatives as well as type A that love their list view. 
they're always open for ideas and and really try to bring the community in. Did we have some growing pains? Sure, every company yeah. has that. Um, but it's just they kind of have become family. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you wrote a book. Mm-hmm. I, so for someone listening right now, click up Trello, Asana, Monday.com. These are different project management tools is really what they are. I know I have my opinion on not the different platforms because I haven't really played with that many of them. I have my opinion on having a platform. Mm -hmm. I'm so curious as someone who literally teaches this stuff, who works right hand with them, who's written a book about ClickUp, at what point should someone, and I say should in quotes, I say that lightly, at what point do you think someone should move their business onto a project management project management system. Do they need to have a team? Is it when they're a solopreneur? Like when's the good, perfect, correct, right time? The moment you are making money with your business. Okay. Um, so it's it's the 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 idea is things need to get out of your head. I'm like, even when I think back uh to me doing web design, I wasn't doing much of project management at that point. I started at the entail of me doing web design because I realized that I was sitting there and I'm like, okay, did I do the meta tags for that side? Did I do the optimization on that side? Did I actually get this from the client? Do I still need to do that? So even though I've built hundreds, maybe even thousands of websites every single time, I've wasted time trying to figure out if I've done something or if I didn't do something. But so can getting I just that use post-it notes, can I just use an, a to-do list on my desk? You can use a to-do list. And that's actually what I recommend clients do initially is take pen and paper and just write it down. Don't you don't need to start digital and with a project management system, but you need to get it out of your head. So pen and paper, write it down, have it next to you. And the inter- interest interesting thing that happens often is. My clients already recognize when they start writing things down, it's like, okay, why am I doing this step at that point? That makes no sense. Right. It makes way more sense to to get the graphic done at this point in the process. So that's the first advantage. And then going digital means you can automate things. Friday Friday is my finance Friday, meaning every Friday I have an hour that means... Once a month, it means I need to download my bank statements. Every week, it means assigning my my account charges and everything that's happening and really to stay on top of it. If I only have a calendar entry for that, chances are at some point I'm going to forget to download my bank statements and my bookkeeper is going to be mad with me or I forget something. So my Finance Friday is a task template that automatically recurs every Friday and blocks that hour. I don't have to think about it anymore. Mm-hmm. Now I get to play rather than freaking out on Wednesday. I'm like, okay, wait, I need to schedule my Friday for the Finance Friday. Do I have everything? What do I need? How? What? It just really gives you that freedom of not having to talk about it, uh, not to think about it, not to to tell your team you have to do it if you have a team. It really just opens up your brain power, just like when you write it down. But now we have automatically the recreation of that post-it note that reminds you what you need to do. Yeah. And it's not on your desk making it messy, (laughs) which that clutter in itself, it takes up brain capacity and space. It's the kind of same thing as who Steve Jobs and some of the other great thought leaders who like wear the same thing every day. It's just to not have to make the decision. Oh God, yes. The amount of brain space, like you're saying that those little decisions take up, it's actually crazy. And I have learned a lot of my friends and mentors, really top level entrepreneurs, eight figure, you know, nine figure business owners, they automate a lot of things in their life where it's not necessarily on click up, but it's like, okay, maybe it's a meal prep service. Maybe mm-hmm. it's uh, wearing the same thing every day. Maybe it's a driver. And I know we could sit here and be like, oh, well, that must be nice. But on a smaller scale, we can do that ourselves, right? In our life. And I know for me, even a silly example, my dog every month has his little like heartworm or flea tick pill or whatever they have to give him. Mm -hmm. And it's an automated repeated reminder on my Google calendar every single month. It's the first Monday of the month at four o'clock in the afternoon. There is just, it's just there. 
and I'll see it every single time. Cause I, I live and work off of my Google calendar. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things where like, I don't have to think about it anymore. I don't have to remember. I don't have to put a sticky note in the kitchen and Mike and I share the Google calendar. So it's like, great. We both see Montana gets his pill tomorrow, right? Like it's such an easy thing and you just don't realize how much brain space this stuff takes up. Let's talk for a second about this idea of repeatable tasks. So mm -hmm. not repeatable systems, but I think a lot of people listening don't realize how many repeatable tasks they're actually doing in their business, whether it's a day-to-day -day or launch to launch, project to project. So can you mm -hmm. give us some examples? Like what's a repeatable task that you notice maybe in your business, maybe in clients' businesses? Um, as I already mentioned, like finance Friday, getting all of your bookkeeping ready to go, um, could be your team meetings, could be uh, analyzing your analytics. If that is website, if that is social media, because if we don't have a goal and we don't know what's happening, how are we going to be able to scale our business? Um, it also could be something like taking yourself to a massage, yeah. right? How often do we not take time for ourselves? Yeah. So it's like, it's also a repeatable task or a reminder to, to do those things. Um, often enough, I also implement with my clients a morning routine, not, not necessarily our private morning routine, um, but rather a DMO, a daily method of operation, meaning we have in the morning a half an hour to an hour to really take time and get certain things out of the way. Checking your email initially, if you have a team, checking in with your team, quick checking the social media messages and all the things to really know what's going on right now. Based on that, adjust how you run your day. What are you taking care of today? And I really like doing, having this idea of having three things I want to get done today. And that's it. If you have a big launch, the launch is just one task. So let's not do three things in, in those times. Yeah. Um, but really setting yourself up for success. So that DMO, that daily method of operation becomes a recurring task in the morning. And we also have fun with where it's like, okay, go grab your coffee and then we'll check the email. Yeah. With a DMO, the daily, what is it? Daily method of operation. Method of operation. Mm -hmm. are we thinking about the DMO the night before or do you, uh, do you get to the DMO in the morning? Like, let's say it's nine o'clock. I sit down with my cup of coffee. I'm at the computer. DMO is scheduled into my calendar for a half hour. And now I'm first figuring out what I'm focusing on. Or is it something that like, I know ahead of time. I do. I do a combination of it. So the daily DMO is really, it's a morning thing. It's like, okay, let's check everything that came in something that I might not have taken care of uh, mm -hmm. yesterday but I also do it in combination with prepping my week. And I'm somebody to prep my week on a Friday so that I can go into the weekend knowing like, cool, comes Monday morning. I know what's happening. It's not this, this oh my God, where, where, what, first, how, when, what are we focusing on? So it's a combination. I do have a couple people in my community that do like to prep the DMO in the evening meaning planning out their day, what are they doing? And they just do a quick run through in the morning if they need to adjust something. Yeah, I love that. A couple other examples too, just as we we're talking about it, because this is how we really love, like we use monday.com. But one of the things that we really love is because we launch less often as mm -hmm. when we used to launch, for now, let's say Empower, which is our signature program, we literally only launch it once a year that is nine months or so between launches where there is no way that we are going to remember all the things that we need to do. So with a launch, whether it's for Empower or something else, there's always repeatable tasks where it's like, okay, did we write the sales emails? Did we write the promo emails that are going to push the launch vehicle? What is the launch vehicle? Does the launch vehicle have an opt-in page? Does the opt-in page need a Canva graphic? Who's creating the Canva graphic? So when you look and you like zoom out, and we talk about this all the time, you just said it before launch is not like launch itself is, is one task you can say, but like it's one project. It has millions of tasks within it. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing, right? When people approach, like, I'm going to write a sales page tomorrow. And it's like, yeah, right. Like, hold on what actually goes into a sales page. Mm -hmm. So the beautiful thing about these project management tools, or if you're just starting with post-it notes 
is you start to create a process for yourself where every single time you're creating a sales page, you start to realize, well, actually, before I write the copy, I need to know what's the offer. And if I'm going to create the offer, what's the transformation? And if who's the ideal client? And what's the messaging? And what's the headline? And then it's like, okay, what's the branding and the colors? And, you know, there's so many different things that we need to do. And I know for us, it's like, you want to change one thing on the page that might require you to go into Canva to create a new image, to put it back into the page. So this idea that we write down things on our list, and I think we do this in our personal life too, we'll write to-dos down that are not actually singular Mm to-dos. And then we look at them and they're so overwhelming that we don't do them. We procrastinate. And then at the end of the day, we're left with all these things on our list that we haven't done yet. And yeah, talking about full-fledged processes and workflows, especially with launches, right? It's, It's also of a huge advantage of being able to optimize things. Let's be honest, launches can be tiresome. It's There is a lot of energy that goes out there no matter how you launch. It's exciting. It's it's potentially a roller coaster if things go really well or maybe not as planned. There's a lot going on in launches. Now, the first time you launch is kind of like when you start building down your process. It's like, okay, suddenly you realize, like you mentioned, oh, yeah, right. I need this to actually be able to do that and all the things we don't want to go through the same exact process again. So starting when you do a process the first time, when you launch something for the first time, starting to really get those tasks down and those processes helps you, first of all, get it out of your head. Second of all, the second time around, you run it. And I hope you listen to Jess and you actually evaluate your past launch so you can do better the next time especially when you have big time in between, do your launch review right when it's fresh in your head because you can then take that data and adjust the process for the next time, which means more of your energy, more of your attention can go to the actual launch than the admin part of that launch. Mm -hmm. You get, you get to not just optimize your sales page and your landing page and your voice and all the things you also get to optimize the process Right. Where did things get stuck? Where can you potentially automate things? Where can you potentially um, switch a tool if need to be or use Make or Zapier to connect different tools to transfer information and it doesn't have to be you manually entering it. Yeah. So you get to optimize this, but it also helps using a tool like Monday or ClickUp. And honestly, any tool that you actually use is the best one. Yes. Say it again. It, it's I you know I love ClickUp, but ClickUp is not gonna help you if you don't actually use it. So I'm never gonna push somebody to you have to use ClickUp. No, Monday is a great tool too, but no tool is gonna help you if you don't actually use it. And every tool is gonna come with a learning curve. So expect to put some work in initially to understand how the tool is working. And. With that, just being able to look at this huge process with a launch, especially when you're running it the first time, you need the sales pages, you need the landing pages, you need the social copy, you need all of the promo, you need potentially your masterclass, your freebie. There's so many things that goes into a launch. It's going to be overwhelming looking at all of it at once. Yeah. But if you have it in a project management tool, you can put your blinders on. Because if you've decided on a timeline for this, this, that's hopefully at least by the second or third time you run your launch, a realistic timeline, you can you can drill down on information. You don't have to look at the whole process of, right. I don't know, two, three, four month launch, maybe a, even a two month launch, two, three, four week launch, or potentially if it's something bigger, a month or two month launch. You don't have to look at the whole thing all at once. Yeah. You can deal, you can look into your sprints, meaning the next week or two matters if you're running sprints or how you how you run them. You can drill down on a specific task, meaning, okay, I really just want to focus on that sales page for now. Look at your subtask. Okay, what do I need for that? And just focus on that and be able for a time put on those blinders and focus on the thing 
the, just the next thing that you need to get done. Yeah. It's so funny as you're talking through it, my brain's like, I feel like it's almost better for a newer solopreneur to start using these than it would be. Of course, when you have a team, like you for sure need a project management tool, but I feel like it's one of those things where when I look back, I don't regret anything in my business. I don't, I wouldn't change anything in my business, but it is one of those things where I'm like, I do wish I probably would have been more organized with this stuff. Like I wish I would have started some of these processes earlier instead of figuring out the growing pains with the team or even metrics. Like I wish that I did start measuring some metrics and data and looking at numbers sooner than I did. It doesn't matter. We're here now. And I know the importance of them. And I also know how just overwhelming it is when you're a solopreneur, Mm -hmm. when you're beginning your business, when you're starting, I think about our clients in empower and I'm like, there is no way they would be able to manage all of that right now with putting stuff into, they don't even know what their systems are. Like they don't even know what their process is. I'm, I'm walking them through it for the first time. So they're just doing, as I say, you know? Um, So I think it does take like a little bit of grace for yourself. If you're listening, it will likely take a little while, some time, a couple launches before you realize like, oh, interesting. I do this every single time. I might change Mm -hmm. it, but every time I approach this type of project, I'm doing this type of task again. So that's where it's like just so helpful to know that you can plug it in. And the cool thing about, I'm assuming ClickUp does the same thing. And the cool thing about these project management tools is then year over year or month over month, when you go to do that task again, we just clone the project. So every Mm -hmm. time we launch Empower, like we just clone the last one and then we make any changes that we need to make, but like everything's laid out. It's even broken down by week. And it's like, we did the, it's almost the idea of like doing the work once and leveraging it after, right? It's like, we put the work in, it was not fun. It took a lot of time, (laughs) but it's like, once it's done, then you're just, you're just, like you said, optimizing. You've said a couple words that I want to talk about. So you've said optimize, mm-hmm. you've said systems, you've said um, automations, and I know we both feel the same way about scaling as well. Talk for a second through, let's talk about automations. Like what does an automation look like? How does somebody set one up? Is it only technology that you can be automating? How does that work? It has so many ways to automate and how how you can look at automation. And automation could be something as simple as, doing time blocking on your calendar and say, okay, I am blocking the time from noon to one for lunch because I tend to get into things and then forget to eat lunch. So my Google calendar reminds me to actually eat. Um, Or if it is looking at how you get up in the morning. My last year was a lot of data collection and automating how I function best, which means I have a regular routine in the morning and a routine is nothing else than a habit is nothing else than automating the best way something runs. And it can go as, again, as small as a regular Google calendar entry, which I do for time blocking to task automation, meaning, hey, when a task gets added to this list, I automatically add the subtask to it because it's always the same thing. To full-on process automation, meaning, okay, we ran this launch once, we have our process down, now we clean this up again, but every single time I generate a new list for a new launch, this whole thing comes in, including due dates and all the things and all the stuff. Now, for everybody listening, don't don't get yourself too worked up with this, really down. If you are not doing a lot of automations yet, start with a scheduling calendar. It's It can be as simple as that. I live off my Google Calendar just as much as you live off of it. <laughs> and going for and back five times to find the perfect time for my client to jump on a call Put an explanation to it. Don't just be like, hey, jump on my calendar. Say, hey, to make this most efficient for both of us, see if you can find a perfect time for you on my scheduler. If not, reach out and we'll manually find a time. But automations can be as simple as just using a scheduler. Yeah, honestly, I feel like Calendly using a scheduler back in the day was probably the first best automation I ever did. Mm -hmm. Because that back and forth, whether it's in the DMs or email of like, trying to schedule someone to come in for a call or podcast or whatever. It's so much time and brain power. And then you're dealing with time zone 
differences and then that's always a mess up and <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm like 17 years in the states and I'm still dealing with time zones Germany is easy on that have one time, time zone. zone yeah one time zone yeah <laughs> well I know and then we were living in Arizona who doesn't do daylight oh, savings God. so like mm -hmm. we would change halfway through the year either two hours behind or three hours behind from east coast such a hodgepodge when we lived on the on the road in the RV it was like that was the biggest pain point was it's the like, time zone. It was where, constantly changing. Where are we? Which time zone are we in? <laughs> it's so true though. Having those little types of automations are just so helpful for the brain space. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about some of this stuff, though, I'm not going to lie. It doesn't sound sexy. Automations, calendar, reminders. You and I both live off our calendar. Like I feel like for a lot of people that sounds, that's confronting because it doesn't sound like freedom. It sounds like, gosh, they're living off their calendar. That's not spontaneous. That's not sexy. That's not the life of freedom that I want to live. I would love to just talk about that for a second. Interestingly, yeah, I know that is, that is a lot of the perception. And I have also experienced in my business life as well in my personal life of learning this how boundaries are actually sexy and meaning <laughs> running automations, using your calendar, doing certain things in my personal life, they can be really sexy because what it does is like putting in those boundaries initially might not be sexy. It can potentially stretch your comfort zone a lot. It's, I had troubles learning to say no. Um, my first initial getting comfortable with saying no in my business was actually implementing a scheduler because it was written down black on white. The scheduler said, we are only recording podcasts on Thursday. You can't schedule another day. It was my first step of setting certain boundaries in business. How do you work past the mindset though, that you might lose out on something? Cause I'm the same way, but it's like, okay, well, if that guest can't come on on a Thursday, then did you lose the opportunity? So how do you shift that mindset? We have how many million people on earth? Does it have to be the one that doesn't align with you? Mm. And it takes, it takes. I'm like, don't get me wrong. I, there is still, even though I'm quite doing well with my boundaries nowadays, there are still moments where I'm like, hmm. and will I do, will I make an exception for certain people? Yeah. If I really want somebody in a conversation on a podcast as a client, will I adjust? Yeah, I had clients that got to schedule a call with me manually at 9 a.m., even though other clients usually just get to talk with me after 10, after I had my coffee and I'm actually functioning fully. Yeah. So you can, and once in a while, you're more than welcome to open up those boundaries, but in general, those boundaries are appreciated, not just by you once you get to the point because it opens up your brain power. There is something to be said of having clear boundaries in place because it limits overthinking. Mm. It means you know exactly where that line is. You know exactly where you put those, which means, oh, I don't have to worry about that. I'm just moving that to tomorrow. Or I'm not dealing with this this weekend because I'm off. I'm not touching my email. Now, suddenly, you have this freedom of knowing exactly what those boundaries are, of knowing exactly how much time your launch is going to take because you have the full-on process and those boundaries and time commitments in your project management yeah. that you are like, oh, cool, I can do that. Yeah. It's not anymore the, 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 this feeling of, oh, my God, I'm completely overwhelmed. I don't even know what to do first. I don't know where to go. Because you've set those boundaries, the time commitments, the time estimates, the, the processes, and you can just duplicate all of that. It's like, okay, cool. We can't make the launch for June. We are doing the launch for August because we know exactly how much time right. we need for this. Now I have the freedom of be like, okay, I can breathe. I feel safe. I can do this, which then also allows you to just 
go. It, it, it opens up all of that creative freedom and getting to play and getting to have fun because boundaries doesn't mean anything else than having clear data. Yeah. It's not a, do you want to be my friend? Yes, no, maybe. You eliminate the maybe. <laughs> you, you eliminate the maybe. Yeah, eliminate the maybe. This is what we always talk about, though. It's it's structure creates freedom. And I can think of mm -hmm. so many examples in my business, even in my personal life, where the you keep calling them boundaries. I'm also thinking them. I'm such a visual person. It's like when you go bowling and you put the bumpers up. Mm -hmm. right? Like that's what the structure is. It's the bumpers. And so you can bowl down the bowling alley aisle. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it would be called row. Hey, it's an alley. It yeah. Bowling alley. You can bowl, throw the ball and like you're safe because if it's going to hit a bumper, it's okay. You know, it's going to come back to center, but we also can remove them. Right. And I think that that's the part people think when something is so structured, especially because we both work with so many creatives, so many mm -hmm. visionaries, myself included, I am a visionary. It could feel like a strangulation. It could feel like, well, now I can't breathe because you're making me do something inside of this container. And it's when you can look at it the other way around the structure, the container, the bumpers, they're just there for safekeeping. They're there to safeguard you. They're there to keep the ball within the lane, but it's also okay if we remove them or the ball bumps out to the other lane, or you never even let go of the ball. Like it, it's okay. They're just there for protection. Mm -hmm. And so I know for us, we just had an experience during our last launch of Empower. DBE Live is our big live event that we put on. And Mike and Lauren had set up a particular system down to the day where every single day there was a particular task that was going to happen for part of this launch. And I would say it was a 30 day, every single day, there was a thing. And there was a 30 day block, probably about seven days into the 30 days, they scrapped the entire plan. But what happened was imagine it's almost like I could equate it to like coming up with a post every day. So mm -hmm. they, they went into this prepared with one post for 30 days and seven days into it, they decided to sort of scrap it. But what they were left with was 23 more post ideas that they could either move, switch, use, work off of, use as inspiration. And some of them they never even used, some of them they never got to, but it allowed like to have it set in stone. No one was waking up in the morning frantic thinking about what are we going to say today? What are we going to post today? And that wasn't the exact thing that they were doing, but it's a good example. And that structure that they had in place created the freedom for what you said to feel safe for them to throw the whole damn thing away. Like it didn't yeah. matter. It was like, okay, well, cool. We knew where we were going. We gave ourselves the, the baseline. We have those bumpers. We can use it if we want. But also as we got into it, they were kind of like, we don't need this. Like the creativity and the juices were flowing. And then they were able to be more reactive mm -hmm. from what they were hearing from the members and the clients and the people coming through DBE Live. So it's just, it's an interesting way to look at it because I think a lot of the resistance for majority of the entrepreneurs, because most of us are visionaries is, yeah, but Evie, if you make me do it this way and you're creating this container, then I can't be the creative I want to be. And I think there's just a different way that we get to look at that. Yeah. Because it's like, it, it happens. It actually happens the other way around because yeah. you're not stuck in in the everyday admin stuff, you actually suddenly have that freedom of, of not being overwhelmed and, and not being the, oh my God, what do I need to do that you get to play, you get to test, you get to be creative. Yeah. And uh, I think one, one of the big things that also happened for me, because I'm as systems oriented as I am, same here, full on visionary. And I do go down rabbit holes and, and shiny object syndrome, right? And in the past, when I sometimes did put the bumpers down, I was like, okay, test something out. Do I, How does this feel? What do I want to do with this? Am I switching tools? Am I Am I switching my whole business around, right? So I just got to play a little bit but I had those those bumpers ready to go up when I discovered that it just didn't align. Yeah. So I was able to go back to, you know what? This this was nice. I got to play a few days or a few weeks with a shiny object. But it just doesn't feel right. 
Yeah. So I was able to just test it out, knowing that I have a safety net, just putting the bumpers back up and go back to what it was or adjust what I had accordingly to with, with what I learned. So nice to know that you get shiny object syndrome too. <laughs> oh. Fridays, Fridays for me are usually a play day. It's if it's an overflow day and it's a go play with new tools, go do whatever floats your boat. There is no morning routine. There is no nothing. So I can just play because I have the tendency if I don't play like that with again, I can because I have the bumpers ready to go back up again. I get antsy and I I potentially turn into this woman that suddenly comes out with a bald head or a complete other, I could potentially change everything Yep. just because I didn't allow myself to go shiny object syndrome. So I planned it in. I planned it in every sure. week to just go play and go test and go do and potentially break things in my click up, what, whatever floats my boat that day. Yeah. I'm curious if in that time when you have play, do you ever use that also to like learn or take a new course or read a book or get, just get inspired by a podcast or something? All the things. Yeah. Friday is completely just following where my intuition leads me. It could be a full on day on my patio, just reading something. If that is self-development or if that's just self-care, reading a smart book, if that is going down the rabbit hole with a tool, if that is, um, testing out, yes, shiny object syndrome for me is also updating my own processes and task yeah. templates. Yeah. Um, what it's literally, it's just following my intuition. Often enough, I wake up in the morning and I do try to not jump right into work in the morning because I know I easily can burn myself out if I let myself do that. Yeah. On Fridays, if I wake up, way early potentially or way late it doesn't matter and I just get to do I just get to play whatever that means that day yeah I love that you're using the word get right because I think also there's all these rules and structure and the millionaire morning and get up at five and you have to do cold plunge and duh, 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 mm. duh, 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 duh. and it's exhausting and if I look back and I've shared this before at baby Jess 10 years ago when I was on people's podcasts and they would ask me about my morning routine, I would break it down to the minute. And if I didn't have it perfectly in that order, in that minute and all the things, mm -hmm. then I didn't think that I was going to have a successful day. Now on like the complete opposite end of that, the pendulum has swung so far to the other side. Full transparency this morning, I woke up at five just on fire, like mm -hmm. the ideas, the motivation, the creativity, and believe it or not, friends, I went right to the computer. Like I sat on the couch and from five to seven, I just got a bunch of things done. Cause it was like, mm -hmm. I, I just, I felt it coming through and I was like, it's okay if I do the workout later or skip the meditation or whatever that might be. And I think as I've gotten older, it's also just been more permission for myself, but permission to anybody listening, you know, my, my mentor who, you know, he posted a reel recently and it was hilarious, but he said like, I don't wake up at 5 a.m. I don't do contrast therapy with cold plunge and sauna. I don't work out every day. I don't hang out with only people who are quote unquote crushing it. And I still do eight figures a year. Like I'm okay, you know? And it's just like, yeah, when did we, when did we all play into this bizarre narrative that it has to be this way? And it's like, I had, I had a similar day on Monday. I woke up Monday at like 4 30 5 o'clock and I was on fire and I'm like I'm gonna roll with it yeah um the thing the thing for me is I don't do the five o'clock usually it's like don't talk to me I, I'm not even having an alarm before 6 30 and that comes based on my data from the last year when sure. when is my body as at its best but I'm also not gonna let that determine it me making myself feel guilty because I have a creative streak and it's just flowing and it's just going. However, I do pay attention when that is an ongoing because again, I am a data person. I've like, I'm wearing the aura ring and I've worn it since version one and I have never taken it off. Looking at how my body reacts, how I feel, right. when I feel comfortable in my body, I have realized certain patterns, meaning if I have three, four, five days in a row where I start on my laptop in the morning and I start on that higher energy, I will crash the weekend. Yep. 
So even though on day three, I might still have that, I'm like, okay, let's let's put this aside for a little bit, even if I'm itching to jump right on my laptop and go walk first and then go on my laptop because I know if I do this a week in a row, I will right. crash. My favorite thing about hosting a podcast is that I get to interview some of the coolest people, like the best thought leaders, the most successful entrepreneurs. And it is no surprise to me that there is a theme where it is the awareness period. Like that's a statement. Like it's just having awareness, right? We always talk about it on this podcast, awareness, acceptance, and action. Those are the three A's. But what I'm hearing you say is having the awareness of self. And I just got off another episode. I was interviewing someone else and the same conversation ended up happening. And we were talking about CPA, financial investing and awareness of self came up. And it's like, gosh, this theme, 200 episodes in, 200 plus episodes in. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, we all talk about how success leaves clues. There is something to be said for doing the work to get to the place where you have an awareness of self. Because it doesn't matter what Evie does. It doesn't matter what Jess Glazer DeRose does. It doesn't matter how I run the business or what platform I use. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be what is best for you. And I love that you stand by that. And I love that you talk about that with everything that you've been through and all of your knowledge and all of your years of experience and the business that you run. It's just like your super masculine strategy like I am. But then at the same time, you're like, yeah, but I know who I am and I know what's best for me and I know what I need. And hearing you say that just makes me really happy. And, and it's it's been <laughs> it's been a journey to get here. Um, oh, it wasn't easy. There, there have been years like that where oh, it, I woke up like this. I was born like this. Um, they were more than enough years where I didn't take care of myself, where where I did not pay attention to what's best for me. Where it was like. Where I spend time for everybody else, where I made decisions for everybody else. And it's like, done the work, done the work, looking, looking at myself, calling myself out, surrounding myself with amazing coaches and mentors that can be like, Evie, are you did did you look at that? You sure about that one? You sure that aligns? It helps having, it helps a lot, having people in your life that love you enough to call you out when you need it and yep. still give you a hug right afterwards. I can do both. Mm -hmm. I can do both. <laughs> you do both. Oh, well, my friends, we, I'm like, we're just, we're coming up on an hour. I feel like we're just getting to the good stuff at this point, but I want to be mindful of your time. So before we get into some rapid fire questions, I would just love to know what do you have going on? What's happening with business? Where can people find you? How can they work with you? Pimp yourself out. Big pivot moving from one-on-one -on -one to group coaching. So there's a reason why I joined the mastermind ladies. If you haven't looked at it, you are missing out. So big launch happening with Automate to Dominate to, yeah, really help people automate their business to dominate their niche. It's It's been, it is a journey. It's a fun journey. It's sometimes a challenging journey and it's all quite worth it. Um, we had just launched the book. So promoing the book, all, all kinds of things of finally stepping into my power and and showing up with my awesome, owning it, doing Who's all the, the things. Who's the book for? The book is Mastering the Basics of ClickUp. So having seen the need of, cool, I have an understanding of my processes, but how do I actually implement it? So the book is built around that, that the potentially missing knowledge of ClickUp is not what holds you back. Mm. Um, that's what it was written for. And where can people really find have it? those basics? Um, Amazon, actually, self-published oh, cool. on Amazon after two years and two publisher journey that that's that's one for another podcast but yeah um pretty much all the things going on between the book between automate to dominate um uh, my startup your click up membership all of the things are right on my website askev.com that's a s k y v i dot com we're working on a rebuild right now to make it really easy to access access all of the freebies all of the good stuff making it really simple I love it. And same on Instagram, askyvi, A-S-K-Y-V-I. 
I'm the lucky one that has the same handle on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all the things. I got oh. lucky on that one. So nice. That's so nice. I'm like, maybe I could have had the same handle, but I keep changing my name. So <laughs> everything mm -hmm. is different, but it's all good. All right. You ready for some rapid fire? Bring it on. Aside from the ClickUp book that you wrote, are you currently reading anything else? I am going down a lot of personal reading and just taking some brain power off. I am a non-recovering smut fan. You're in the smut game. Mm -hmm. I love it. For those who don't know what smut is, <laughs> give us a PG version. Ah, some spicy encounters where yeah. in my case, male and female having fun on different levels of fun. Love it. Love so it. PG enough. <laughs> I feel, yeah. I feel like in the last few years, the majority of my friends, especially in the entrepreneurial space, have gotten into like romance novels and smut. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting how that's happened as like a shift. I don't know if it's the reticular activating system just firing off where I'm like, oh, everybody's reading these books now. Cause I switched to fiction two years ago as well. I still read business books, but about two years ago, I was like, oh, I should start reading fiction again. And I was like, wait a minute, this is amazing. It's like a chick flick, but on a book. And I oh, love chick flicks. And book talk. I know. <laughs> oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I'm, I'm ranging anywhere from, from rom-com style to quite spicy. Okay. So I it's fun. It. I'm like, okay, what do, what do I feel like today? What did little Yvie be when she grew up? Say that one more time, please. When you were a kid, what'd you want to be when you grew up? I actually never had a plan. No. I, I never know. had one of those. I I want to be this or that. Yeah. I love it. And then and then I became an electrician to make daddy proud. There you go. If you were going to give a TED talk on nothing that you're known for, so no systems, no automations, no dominations, no um, team, no any of that, what would the TED talk be on? The one that's being written behind the scenes, being bulletproof. Ooh, we will have to have you back on. I want to hear more about that, especially knowing a little bit of your history. I mm -hmm. love that. It's it's built it's built up on that. Yeah. They say, I don't know who they are, but they say new levels, new devils. What is something that you're currently challenged by? Trust. Self Trust. or other people? Um, me and the universe. Yeah. Making I'm really great at manifesting away the things I don't want in my life anymore and I don't want to do. And it, in the past, it seems to have taken a little bit and, and quite some deep breathing to get where I do want to be and build the things I do want to build. Yep. So I'm smacked up in the middle of okay, I let go of the things I don't want to have, but the things I do want to have are not here yet. Mm. So it's this, I've been here before. I've done this before. It's definitely a different journey than it was the last time. The trust that I can do it. Yeah. I love that. Last two questions. The $50,000 question. If I were to cut you a check tomorrow for $50,000 and you had to use it in or on the business, you could split it up or you could use it in one lump sum. How would you invest it? A big part of that would go to exposure right now. Yeah. Um, bringing new people into my circles, getting that exposure, getting it out there. Cool. I love it. Some marketing. And then the final question. I think you know this. The reason we named the company Digital Business Evolution is because we believe that we're always evolving and growing. And as we evolve and grow, so does our business. What is your next personal or business evolution? Ask Evie is becoming a full and educational company. So this brings me to, to the full on five year big picture. Um, the goal with Ask EB is to actually turn this into a full and educational company with the certification of, hey, I know how to do business, meaning bringing in all of my experts, all of my friends, legal, accounting, all of the things. That's that's the immediate goal. The long-term goal is to also establish a nonprofit that goes alongside with it. Because again, as I mentioned earlier, I do want to give women the freedom of choice, which means the educational piece would be there to learn how to build a business, meaning teaching them how to fish rather than just giving them the fish. Yep. 
the nonprofit would take care of the physical requirements that are potentially needed, yeah. meaning housing, meaning community, meaning childcare, meaning um, office spaces and educational spaces. I love that. That's the big goal. I'm so excited for you. And I'm just super grateful to be on the journey with you be a tiny little baby part of everything that you're building because what you're building is just incredible. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Friends, if you love this episode, make sure you take a screenshot, tag it on social media or post it on social media. Tag me, I am Jessica DeRose. Tag Yvonne at AskYV, A-S-K-Y-V-I. Let us know what some of your takeaways were or if you're ordering her book, let us know when you get the book, if you're gonna test out ClickUp or just really dive a little bit more into systems and automations and see how they can truly change your life and business. Because speaking from experience, they can and they will, I promise. Once you can get past the mindset of they're strangling you, they are not, they actually create the freedom. Evie, thanks so much for being here. I love you. Thanks so much for having me and thanks for being on this journey with me. Uh, as always, friends, cheers to your evolution. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you loved this episode, I invite you to be a part of our ripple effect and share it with a friend. And please, if you feel called, take 30 seconds to leave a five-star review and I'll be forever grateful. Until next time, cheers to your evolution. <laughs>